I had no self-confidence for writing. And so in the internship, uh, my director uh, at one point for one of my papers told me I was not a good writer. And so I went on with that for nine years. Hello and welcome to The Writer's Mindset with me, Christina Adams. And me, Ellie Betts. Each week, we're here to bring you the strategies and advice you need to achieve your writing goals. This week, we're talking to Tara Kelly about writing contemporary romance. Tara Kelly is an author who's been publishing for almost seven years. She writes contemporary romance and romantic suspense. She's also an author coach and helps aspiring writers to move past their barriers so that they can finally share their stories. She does that through a course, membership, one-to-one training and more. I spoke to Tara about writing romance and how she overcame her biggest writing obstacle. Mm, The biggest obstacle. I'm intrigued. Mm -hmm. You'll have to listen to find out. If you find this and our other episodes valuable, you can support The Writer's Mindset over on Patreon. You'll get early access to episodes, bonus content, and our undying gratitude for supporting all of the work that goes into creating these episodes to inspire and motivate you. If you'd like to join us, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash writer's mindset. Thank you so much to all our patrons for helping us keep creating content. And an extra shout out to our newest patron, Yulia Stuber. And I really hope I pronounced that right. I'm sorry if I didn't. I'm so bad with names. How's your writing been going this week then, Ellie? Writing has been on and off, I admit. There's been a lot going on. Um, But mostly on. I will say mostly on, which is something. I'm trying to build routines and habits and making sure that I'm sort of contributing to that future every day, if that makes sense. Except maybe at the weekends where I need a rest because rest is important, people. Don't do it seven days a week. Or don't do everything seven days a week. <laughs> it's hard. I'm struggling to make sure I'm doing everything. If it's out of sight, it's literally out of mind and I forget that it exists and forget that I need to do it. But I'm trying different techniques to combat that and to make sure that I'm staying on top of things and doing bits of writing here and there, bits of podcast stuff here and there, occasionally cleaning the house, I guess, so that I still haven't mown the lawn. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's practically winter now. I'll just wait till March. Um, <laughs> for anyone listening in the future, we're currently recording in October. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it's been good. It's been trial and error in terms of making sure I'm using the right techniques to get stuff done. But I think I'm more on the right track now. And the next step for me is re-outlining the Alex Warrington series. So this is a series. It'll be my first series. It's urban fantasy. It's great. I love my my main character. She's hilarious. Um, if I do say so myself. And a lot has changed since my first plan. So the first plan included what is now going to be a completely separate series. Because I had two ideas, I was almost trying to force them into one series. And it took a long time for me to realise actually these need to be two separate series. I was trying to sort of force it into the, force some more complicated stuff into the Alex Warrington series. And it just wasn't working. It was too much. Um, I was trying to fudge it so that her magic system worked with the magic system in the other series. And I should have seen sooner that these were two separate things. But, you know, we got there. (laughs) And that will just have to be the second series. And it's very interesting. And it's about sins and demons and stuff. But it's it's just on the back burner. I'm not worrying about that for now. The Alex Warrington stuff is um, slightly simpler. And that's what I'm focusing on for my first series. That's going to be awesome. I'm excited. I've got some great scenes where I torture characters which is our favorite thing to do right right and I know what's coming for those characters and (laughs) yeah pretty pretty evil I learned from the best well thank you (laughs) and I don't mean you (laughs) I did I did mean you Christina is the queen of torturing her characters (laughs) it's fantastic it's not like I get told off by my beta readers every time I send them a book or anything (laughs) they're like what have you done now (laughs) I'm like giving you something to entertain you Exactly. And it's always entertaining. 
<laughs> With a little bit of comedy this time. Exactly. Alex has some humor on there. She's funny. She I put her in funny situations and stuff. And it's just good fun. It's just good fun. And I'm enjoying it. And that's what counts, right? Exactly. Hopefully if I'm enjoying it, it'll mean the readers will enjoy it. We'll soon find out, right? Because you plan to release next year. Next year is the plan. Summertime next year. Let's say that, but I won't say any more. What about you? How's your writing been going this week? It's been interesting. I've still been writing in the mornings, um, averaging about a thousand words a day. My word count definitely went down. And then I got a bunch done on Friday because we're recording this on a Tuesday. And as my reward, I just sat and wrote Afterlife Calls 4, which is The Witch's Sacrifice. And I think I did four and a half thousand on Friday, six thousand seven hundred on Saturday, and then I finished the book on Friday. So I don't know how many word count, how many words that was. So I went from I think I added about fifteen thousand, probably more than that, over the weekend. And well, I found having an outline really helpful because I wasn't trying to problem solve as I was writing. I thought the final first draft would be longer than normal, and it ended up being exactly the same. It's still about thirty thousand words, and I've come to realize it's because I always forget the subplots. And the subplots do come later in the Afterlife Calls books. And I guess because I've been so focused on that four book arc, I haven't really thought about the subplots enough. Um, so now that I'm going back to edit book three, which is the Necromancer's Secret, I am thinking more about the subplot. Well, that's good. You don't. I don't think you need to have the subplot straight away, right? It's like building a house. You have the foundations first, and then you have the walls and then i, I don't what, know enough about building houses to relate what subplots would be in this analogy but you see what i'm saying right i do but i don't necessarily agree because the reason i started outlining was because i wanted to streamline my writing process and have a more polished first draft so that i can publish faster and if i'm adding in the subplots retrospectively then nothing has changed compared to my old system so i'm still not outlining in enough depth i'm mainly outlining the main plot i'm not including the subplot and I think that might be different for Hollywood Romance, which is the last book, because it's the series is further along and I know what the subplots are because they're tied in with the what happens in series. So I've already written a lot of it. So it is quite different. And I haven't gone back through that outline yet and I probably won't start writing that book until the end of this year at the earliest. But I think there are a lot of takeaways from it because I certainly found outlining my reader magnet for the Afterlife Calls series was very ben- beneficial. And I managed to draft that really quickly. But that's also a short story, right? I can't remember how many words it is, like 10,000. No, it's 7,000 words. So it is very different. And I think the reason that I'm doing it the way I am is because my strength is actually novella writing. It's not novels. And as I've said, I knew what this four book arc was going to look like. It was just a case of how the characters got from the start of the ghost call to the end of the witch's sacrifice. It's getting there. And I don't think the Necromancer's Secret needs loads of work based on the chapters I've gone through so far. But there were some little fuck-ups in The Mummy's Curse that were from scenes that got added retrospectively after the first draft. And that's why I'm wary of the fact that even though I outlined in more depth, I still didn't actually extend the word count of that first draft. But then what I've added so far has mostly been stuff like description and internal monologue. It's not been plot. And that's probably in part because that is the stuff that I don't think about when I write. And I'm almost starting to think of it like when I play a game. I don't play games very often, but when I do, I fucking hate side quests. I like the main plot and the main story, and I like to know how it happens and how it's resolved. And I think that's what my first draft is. It is me finding out how it happens and how it's resolved and getting those words out of my head in kind of like a more extensive version of the outline. Um, And then I go back and do the side quests. But I think what I need to do is at least know where those side quests fit into the main plot when I'm doing those first drafts. I love that subplots of side quests. That's really That's how I feel. That's how I feel because I don't like them. (laughs) I mean that in a negative way. I I play a game and I want to get to the end as quickly as possible. And I think that's why I prefer strategy games because there is no end and because it's exercise your mind without worrying about the story. I get too wrapped up in stories. So it's more comfortable for my brain to get to that end point sooner, if that makes sense. You need the gratification of finishing the main story. You're not getting enough gratification from doing side quests. That. 
That exactly. I don't know how you manage to articulate my thoughts without me being able to articulate my thoughts. But I, I speak fluent, Christina. We've been through this. <laughs> that point, that point. I can interpret and translate as well. So, <laughs> But I am really pleased with the final version of The Mummy's Curse. Oh, it's like, funny you should mention that because I also have that book. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to believe that that wasn't planned. <laughs> it wasn't, no. <laughs> but that was I, already um, on my desk. I went to pick it up while you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was already here because I it only re- arrived the other day, and I've just been admiring it. Because look at them, they're so pretty. I mean, listeners can't look at them, but listeners can't. But if you're on YouTube, but... you can now see us aggressively holding Christina's books up to the camera. Yeah. I do like the covers; they're very pretty. I spotted a lot more when I was going through the Mummy's Curse, but in a good way. And all the reviews have been really positive so far and a lot of them have said it's even better than the first book which is obviously amazing it's reassuring because I was nervous releasing this particularly after what happened with the subplots but there is a part of me that's like oh shit can I pull this off and there's a really confident part of me that I think is in your voice Ellie that's going oh how yeah you can do it that is my voice you're right (laughs) (laughs) still that pep talk from book one in my head but that there is a lot to juggle in three and four and it's got to be subtle and that's the challenge for me is pulling off that subtlety because I'm not a subtle person I'm an I, I can be quite quiet but if I want something I will tell you what I want right whereas this is the opposite of everything I have ever done and ever written basically which which is a fun challenge don't get me wrong it's very very fun but it does make me nervous as well. And I can't say any more without any spoilers. So I'm going to shut up now. It's good though. I think that there's, there's a quote and I'm going to completely butcher it now. But the point you start growing is the point where you step out of your comfort zone. And I totally agree with that because I feel like I progressed much more as a writer working on this series. That's not to downplay the Hollywood books, but they're much more in my comfort zone until you hit Hollywood Heartbreak, where I just... Well, it's called Hollywood Heartbreak Break for a reason. Let's say that. That was outside of my comfort zone, but for very different reasons to Afterlife Calls. And the beauty of the Afterlife Calls series is there is so much more that I can do with it that will continue to help me grow as a writer while also entertaining readers like book five may well turn into almost like a little cozy mystery, for example. And it will have much more comedy, possibly even more comedy than The Mummy's Curse. And the point of the Afterlife Cause series is that I do lean into the absurdity of it all. But the overarching theme is, do we have the right to play God? Whether you're religious or not, do you have that right to control or affect someone else's life? And there are lots of different ways that I can represent that particularly when you bring in things like ghosts and necromancy and witches and all of these things. I was originally going to name the series Ghost Calling, and I changed that because I thought this is going to be really limiting. But if I call it Afterlife Calls, then there is so much more that I can do. I can bring in vampires because they're obviously sort of dead. I could bring in zombies. Uh, I probably won't do zombies. Spoilers. (laughs) No, they're not spoilers. I said I could. I could. Mm. Yeah, okay, maybe I made it a spoiler by... By shouting spoilers. Yes, you did. <laughs> Sorry. I briefly mentioned vampires in the episode with Alexa, White Wolf as well. Very briefly. I cut out the main thing that I said that was a massive spoiler. <laughs> but yeah, there's just so much more that I can play with by calling it Afterlife Calls. And my brain is already like on book 10, even though I've only published two books. And I never, ever thought I could write a series that long, ever. Oh, of interest. And this is slightly on topic. You said to me the other day that the point where you put the third book up for pre-sale was where it started to really feel like a series. That's true. I did say that. I think that's interesting because it's one of those things, just because you tell yourself you're writing a series and you've told the audience you're writing a series, you almost don't feel like it's real straight away, right? Yeah. The whole thing of publishing this series feels very surreal to me because I grew up as a fantasy fan and I gave up writing it because I detest world building but I was still reading it and I was still watching it. And I feel like I've come full circle and I still want to work on the empath series because I had that idea first, but I think there are things that I can learn from afterlife cause first that will set me up for empath, which is both more complicated, but also much more subtle. That makes sense. That makes sense. I just think it's valuable for our listeners to hear it as well, that even though you knew it was a series and even though it's actually your basically third series, 
you know, you, you still don't, you're not out there being the most confident person ever. You know, it's still a learning process. Yeah, I don't have any confidence. It's funny because people do say to me, oh, you come across really confident. You always talk to people. I'm like, no, I reply to people because <laughs> I don't like silence. It's not the same thing. No, it's not. I, I know what you mean, but that's good. I think it shows you know, writers are constantly growing and learning. No matter how many books in, you should still be growing and learning. And I think it's good for our audience, wherever they are on our journey, whether they're like me and they're just about to publish a first book or only have a couple of books. You know, it doesn't necessarily become perfectly easy and perfectly um, flawless and smooth. There's still bumps in the road and stuff, right? Oh, yeah. And that's something actually that Tara and I talk a lot about in this episode. Like there is a focus on writing romance but she talks a lot about the obstacles that she faced when she started and how just because she's published something like 30 odd books now, that doesn't mean the imposter syndrome goes away. Exactly. That's the word I was looking for, imposter syndrome, I think, because I definitely have that. And it's it's not something that's ever really going to go away. I imagine you just learn to deal with it in different ways. Yeah, it's just a case of learning to live with it. It's basically the same as any chronic illness. You learn to find workarounds like I had an email from someone the other day saying um oh hey can we work together and my brain was like why does this person want me how did they find me on LinkedIn my LinkedIn profile is terrible but they're finding me and they're saying let's work together my imposter syndrome is just going oh this is all fake oh they're going to change their mind blah 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 but I have to find ways to get it to shut the fuck up so that I can help people because that is my goal to help businesses with their content and I know a lot of the businesses I'm working on at the moment working with sorry not working on that sounds weird um they are very mission driven and their mission is to help people so I'm helping them help more people which is really important to me it's good and that shows in the content that you write and how much you enjoy writing it um that does come across when you've got pieces that you're enjoying and I know you can't tell people on our audience that are listening about them but if you're enjoying what you're writing it comes across right oh yeah 100 percent, and it's a lot easier to write as well I think when you're enjoying it oh yes I can already vouch for that having dragged myself through my dissertation and then just felt like I was on holiday writing Alex Warrington so yeah I can vouch for that as well <laughs> With me today is Tara Kelly. Thank you for joining us on The Writer's Mindset. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. If anyone hears any background noises, by the way, Tara (laughs) is sitting outside, so it's going to get quite (laughs) atmospheric and a little bit relaxing. I feel like I'm listening to a meditation track. (laughs) We'll have like that moment of zen and just kind of take it all in. (laughs) (laughs) So for our lovely listeners then, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. All right. Well, I I always share with people that I never planned to be a writer. So here I am, an author with 32 books published, and I never planned this journey, and it's the best thing ever. I did a little bit of writing poems in high school and had um, written a children's book in 11th grade, um, but my self-confidence was very low for writing. And so no one has ever seen those poems. They sit in a in a little bin underneath the bed, actually, because we're moving. It's not in that place right now. And and then my, like, like I said, self-confidence was never really there. So it just continued on. And I had these things just kind of hidden, but I always had like thoughts that would pop out. So I went back to college at the age of 25 and uh, I went to become a dietitian, which by the way, spoiler alert, that was not my path. And I didn't continue on that, but I did have an awesome jo- time in the college world doing all the things. And you had to do an internship afterwards. And in the internship, mind you, I had no self-confidence for writing. And so in the internship, uh, my director uh, at one point for one of my papers told me I was not a good writer. So it just kind of compounded on all of my thoughts of where I was with my writing. And then she just kind of confirmed for me in my brain, like, okay. And so I went on with that for nine years. And so in 2013, I woke up from a dream. And it was this, it was really a powerful dream. If you're a writer and you understand, then you'll understand that power that a dream can have, right? And I saw the characters, um, I'm a romance writer. And so I saw the characters perfectly as, you know, at a cafe. And I'm like, I have to write this down. I'm also a food blogger and a foodie. So like food and romance mesh together in my world. And, And so I got up 
and self-confidence is still low, but I got up and I wrote that, that uh, dream down and my husband wanted to know more. And that was basically the catalyst. Like when he read it, he just said, I want to know more. And that was the catalyst. That was all I needed to continue with the process of where I am today. And, uh, and within six years, yeah, I had um, written 32 books and published 32 books. And today I still think about that and how crazy it is, but um, somehow I moved past, you know, you still always have those emotions. Like, are they going to write my book? Is this book going to go well? But the community that I built around my books has been really powerful for me. That's an amazing story. Like, I can't believe you had a teacher who was like, you're terrible at this. Like, that's yeah. just, it baffles me. <laughs> yeah, the, the, it baffles me too that you know someone would look at you and say those words, not thinking about um, the impact that just simple words can take on somebody in their life. That's yeah. the thing I think about a lot. Yeah, how did you get over that kind of voice then? Was it just the sheer need to tell this story that you came up with or was it something else? I would probably be fully transparent with you and say that I don't know if you ever truly get over it, but you learn to grow with it. And, uh, and I think that's what I'm doing for myself is learning to just, you know, face that fear and just walk into it and, uh, and continue to create because I know for me, creating brings me so much joy. So holding back is not worth it. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I definitely um, still have moments of uh, self-doubt that creep up. Yesterday, I had imposter syndrome. So absolutely. That's really um, inspiring. I really love that because I totally agree. I have those moments of self-doubt and imposter syndrome. And I get so many people go, but how? It's like, well, just because you published, it doesn't mean those things magically go away. Yeah. Yeah. It never does. Um, you know, you see people around you that, you know, and what they're creating or what they're building, or it could be as simple as, you know, you feel like your book kind of flows with what they're doing in their genre. And you think like, oh, this is going to be great. It'll go really well for you. And then it may not go as well as what they've shared on social, but what we see on social isn't everything in their lives. Right. So um, how well is it really going for them? We don't really know. And so, yeah, to compare um, is a tricky, it's a slippery yeah. slope. And there is a pattern I've noticed where a lot of writers compare their start point to other people's middles. So yeah. it's like, oh, I'm not making as much money. Oh, I'm not, I don't have as many readers or I don't have as many reviews. It's like, well, yeah, you've released one book instead of like 10, 20, 30, whatever. That does make a difference. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, building the community that I did um, and still do, still do, um, takes time, you know? And so for me, like where I put it, uh, like for the readers and how I bring them in, um, I'm going to say the word arc reader, like my arc readers that I have. And, um, and then like how I put them out there on a, a platform called book sprout, you know, those, doing all of that and having those people um, read the books, but it's still like for when I put it on book sprout, when I first released my book and I put it on that platform, it, it takes like it, when I first published on there to try to, you know, just build the community and, and uh, reach around my book. It, it took like six months to really start to see any kind of traction even there. So yeah, like, I guess I kind of went a little bit beyond probably what we were chatting about, but I felt like, I feel like, you know, we have to give it six months, year, it could take a couple of years for us to just kind of just, and you just have to keep doing it. It's that repetition. Yeah. Yeah. That can be super frustrating if you're the kind of person who wants like the quick wins and is very impatient, but that's just not publishing. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. Which by the way, uh, I'm not a patient person and it's actually kind of a joke in the, in my, in my life with my husband not patient at all but I have to yeah I'm not. Right. totally yeah I was notoriously impatient growing up still kind of am now and it didn't <laughs> help that my mother was the kind of person who liked to arrive at the dentist like 45 minutes early and didn't oh. even like remind me to take a book or anything so I was just sat there like watching the terrible tv bored out of my mind as a 10 year old so that probably didn't help encourage my impatience because I was used to waiting yeah. around for nothing <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so kind of back to you and your writing then what drew you to writing romance specifically you know it's funny I 
I like all genres. That's why I'm like, I'm hesitating because I like so much, but at the age of 16, I did dive into Harlequin books, you know, like that I had to devour. Like I remember sitting at my best friend's house and I literally spent the whole day at her house, supposed to be hanging out with her and just got absorbed in, in a Harlequin romance. So I think it was probably, you know, my teenage years loving all the Harlequin books that were out there. But it's funny because before I even started writing, I would listen to audiobooks while I was working. I traveled for my job and I would listen to mystery and nonfiction and science fiction and then romance and it was in drama and whatever. So I'm not really for sure exactly like why like that had to be, but I know the one book that I read and that was Susan Mallory's book, Only Yours. I always um, mix it up. She has only yours and um, and there's another only one. See, I can't even remember it. But Susan Mallory's series, Fool's Gold, and her book, Only Yours, uh, with Montana and Simon. I read that book, uh, audiobook, I listened, and I was like, huh, I'm from a small town. and And I just, and I loved that power that she had with the couple. And then not too long later, I would say not too long later, I had that dream that I was sharing earlier. So um, yeah, I would say that it's weird why I ended up on that path, but I would put it at the Harlequin books and Susan Mallory. Do you find your interest in other genres influences your writing in any way? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of mystery, thriller, um, mob type stories. Love that. And, um, and so, yeah, I feel like I'm able to kind of utilize that, that action and suspense. I do write romantic suspense. So I have contemporary romance, romantic comedy, um, are the main thing that I write, but I do have romantic suspense. Um, and I think that I started that process because I was like, I've got to get the, these emotions of the action and that thriller and that intensity out of me. So, Yeah. I understand that. I was like that with fantasy because yeah. I started off writing fantasy and crime and then left it behind to write romance and women's fiction. And now I've circled back around and now I'm writing romance and fantasy. <laughs> oh, I love that too. Because yeah. that's always been my escape, those two genres. But I just wasn't ready yet to get back into writing them. I needed that time to develop my writing skills and my world building skills and to be confident enough in them to put them out there. That makes sense. Totally. What's your writing process like then? Does it change depending on the subgenre that you're writing? So my writing process has definitely shifted this year because I'm building an online business at this point for myself. So it's finding the time. But when I was solely writing all the time, kind of like I, I transitioned. Like, so I started with doing like not plotting, just like have this idea and then just write it down and just start the process. Um, I was a complete panster all in all in the beginning, but then as like, like the mystery and the thriller kind of like started percolating inside of me, I'm like, I can't just be a panster because there's too much here. So I actually went and read plotting books. I was like, okay, so how the heck do you plot? Mind you guys, like I was not a writer and then I was told I was not a good writer. And so now I am in this world where I've got to figure out how this all works. And so I had no idea how to plot a book. And so I read books on how to plot and I just went for it. And like, I don't know if you've ever read Cam Whelan, but she is amazing on helping you with plotting books. And she really dives deep into each character and how to look at them. And so, yeah, so I basically started as a panster and then went into being a plotter. And so I, I look at like finding um, inspiration with images and um, locations and thinking about who I'm going to be um, writing about. And I put it in, I have a bullet journal and I have Scrivener that I utilize and I write everything out. Um, and so, and then I, I just basically dive into, am I going, well, in the beginning, it took me a couple months to write a book. And then in the end, uh, right before I started building the online business, I was like, I want to, I want to get these books out there. And so I would, test myself. And one of the books I wrote in like 21 days, and it was like a full month of just plotting and planning and getting it all happening. And so I would say that my process is just, you know, plotting, planning, and then, you know, writing that story in a fashion that kind of keeps it the flow moving. I don't want to stop. 
I don't want to have a couple weeks in between. Um, yeah, I think, I think that answers that in a good way. Yeah, definitely. And that seems to match what I've heard from a lot of writers as well, is that they started off not really having a formal, you know, any sort of plan. And then they get to this point and they're like, now this ain't working. I've got to fix this. I've got to have a better system for the next book because I'll be able to do it quicker and it will be tighter. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you have so many books. I feel like too, and I don't know if everyone else would agree with this then too, is that you have so many books that you're starting to create and you're starting to world build. And it's like, I don't even going back to when I said my favorite person is Susan Mallory that I've read and all the hundreds of books that she's written at this point, I think it's over a hundred. And I think like, how do you world build with that much in your brain? You can't after a while, you have to have help in some way and have it written down and plot it out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So thinking about the actual structure of a romance, then one of the big romance tropes is a happily ever after or a happy for now, if it's a series. Why are these so important for the romance genre? I would say it's because of that emotion, that way of, that you feel, you know, you, you, you're so invested in a character and you want to know everything that's going to happen with them. And if you're left hanging with the happily for now at the end, it's like, it just kind of, well, for me, it just like guts me. I'm like, no, I need more now, but I don't mind that, that suspense of like, what's going to happen next. But yeah, I, that emotion, like when I finished a Harlequin book and at 16 to when I watch Hallmark movies today, or, you know, just writing and that finishing that and, and seeing those characters together and, um, it's just, a, I don't know. It's just, it's such a good feeling inside. So, and I know that, um, a lot of my, a lot of the people in my community love that happily ever after because they want, they want to have it ended. They want to see where they're, you know, what happened with them, that emotion that's really powerful. Yeah. I think sometimes there's an element of fantasy going on there as well. They're almost projecting onto one of the characters. So if the character has a happily ever after, it makes the reader feel like they can have their happily ever after as well. Eric- yeah. Yeah. Like you, you wonder if there are things in your life that you want. Um, yeah. Those dreams, those inspiration. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause um, my first series is a celebrity romance and so many people project onto the main characters. Cause it's that whole, Oh, I'm going to go to New York or LA and I'm going to meet Ryan Reynolds or I can't even think of any attractive male actors anymore. That's how little I watch film these days. But, you know, going to go and meet your favorite celebrity and they're going to fall madly in love with you. And it's like, that's probably not going to happen, but it is a fantasy, even if it doesn't involve werewolves. Yeah. And it keeps you, I feel like it keeps your, your day flowing in a positive way instead of having to think in a negative way. Like that is just a, a, a strong, powerful, positive feeling. And why not have that? Yeah, I definitely read more romance when I'm in need of comfort. And also Mm -hmm. I read more fantasy romance when I'm in need of comfort because it's then it's like a heightened version of this world. Yeah. And you've still got the kind of romance and the emotions and the setting to ground it in reality. It's like, oh, maybe werewolves do exist. I've got werewolves on the brain today, apparently. (laughs) And vampires exist too. I know. Weirdly, a vampire has cropped up in my fantasy series and I hadn't intended to include them. So werewolf probably will as well at some point. (laughs) Like I could devour um, romance, romance um, sci-fi that has vampires in it in fantasy. I like I love anything with vampires. Vampires are one of those things. I don't think they're going to go out of fashion anytime soon, are they? Good, good. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I've noticed lately, particularly with American sites, is that generally speaking, swearing is more acceptable in steamy books. And non-steamy books, the assumption is there isn't as much or they are clean. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on swearing in non-steamy romance books. You know, it's funny because, uh, by the way, full transparency, you guys get to know a little bit more about me, is that my husband says that I um, am a drunken sailor with Tourette's. And so <laughs> that would be my <laughs> But I am situational aware and I'm very good with uh, not doing that all the time like this. So swearing in my books, I'm totally fine with, right? You know, but it's funny when I wrote Hope Skipped, which is part of a series that is steamy, but I made it clean. And I, and it's just, that's how the story went. I didn't have a choice. The story decided to be that for me. And when I made it clean, I also 
I felt like this need, like, I can't say the swear words. So I don't know what it is, but there's something about like, and I don't know for me personally, I don't know if it's because the readers that I'm around that talk about how they like to read more of like, whatever it's called, sweet or clean. I know that goes back and forth on that word. Um, and they don't want all the profanity. Um, and so like, like when you're writing it, it's like, you just feel like, oh, I can't put that in there. But personally, like, I don't, I don't mind. I feel like even just a simple, sweet romance, if you say the word shit, or if you say the word hell, like, how is that a problem? It shouldn't be a problem, but it's more about the readers and what they voice on social media that um, influences me and how I react to what I put in my stuff. Um, and yet like, yeah, for non for steamy, I could care less. I do whatever, like I say, whatever. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. How do you think any type of romance differs from other genres like fantasy or thriller in terms of like both the writing and things like reader expectations? When I think about that, I think about my romantic suspense books and one of them almost didn't even have like a sex scene in it because that's how much of a suspense side it was. And I struggled with getting it in there. And I'm like, okay, I have to put this in here. And, and so I feel like the structure is where you're more focusing on that action and that intensity and, um, and the flow to ensure that it's reaching that storyline the way that you'd want it. And so, yeah, there's a difference like, you know, with romance, it's like, okay, we have to have X amount of sex scenes and we have to have X amount of romance and how to, whereas like with action, you can like, not even have to worry about, I mean, you're still doing character development. Of course you are, but you don't have to worry about how you're bringing them together because you get to have so much fun with all the other um, elements that come into play. So, yeah, I think that brings it together. Right. <laughs> For me, because, because like, I really want to write Patricia Cromwell writes like these thriller books that are amazing. And I, and they're like, serial killer thriller type things and she has like this whole series of stuff that she's been writing for a long time and i'm like oh man like that would be super fun to do but it would literally have to take a different part of me you know and take away that whole thinking of romance on any level i would love to challenge myself because i think it is a challenge uh, for somebody that's used to one area oh 100 percent. when i switched from you know writing chiclet and romance to oh, yeah paranormal women's fiction my brain exploded and I nearly quit three times and Ellie and my editor were like no you're fine you've got this you just need to do x y and z and I'm like mid meltdown and they're trying to calm me down from it. it's like this is a good book you just need to fix some things I don't mind. yeah you got this yes yeah I love and, and you know I'm very proud of the finished result you know but it did stretch my writing skills a lot because there are a lot of elements in it that I hadn't needed to think about before and it was more complicated, which I think is so amazing and powerful for um, you as a writer then, too, you know, because it definitely makes us um, a better writer in the end, too. Oh, 100 percent. And I have another series that I'm going to go back to eventually that's also part crime. So that, again, will stretch my writing skills even yeah. further. But I want to get further into the Afterlife Cause series and finish uh, the Hollywood Gossip series first because I don't want to be writing three books, three series at the same time that are so different, you know? I was say, because that would probably confuse the mind on where you've got to go, okay, so today I've got to do this and tomorrow. Like, yeah. I always thought about that, like with my romantic suspense or my romantic comedy. And the romantic suspense is just, you know, it's got some steam, but the romantic comedy is more steamy. And then, you know, and then, of course, the whole aspect of suspense versus comedy. Yeah. Like I, I was like, nope, I have to do them separate completely. One hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. with Do you, you like, like work on one book at a time then and see it all the way through to the end before switching totally. genres? Or do you do like several romantic comedies and then do a suspense or vice versa? Yeah, I, I literally have to write one book at a time and, and just like you said, see it all the way through. Uh, just because because I'm invested in those characters and I don't want to mess up on like um, like little hints or, you know, tips or like little things that the readers will grab. I don't want to mess up and be like, oh, that's right. The eyes were this color or, oh, that's right. You know, they were wearing this or what. I just don't want to do any kind of uh, mix up on that. Yeah, I can relate to that. I'm writing an overlap with my very first book in my 
current book so having to be consistent with things like outfits and hair color I really screwed myself over in terms of hair color because the main character of the Hollywood gossip series changes her hair color on a regular basis in what happens in books and I didn't make a note of what color she changes her hair to at different points so that's going to be fun yeah that's tricky for sure I use Scrivener to write mine do you use a software where you like can put notes into your stuff to to keep track of all that yeah i use scrivener but i never thought of needing to keep track of those things at the time it's just one of those hindsight is a marvelous thing moments where i'm like i really should have made a note for this but i didn't expect the hollywood gossip series to be six books so it wasn't going to be such a big deal at the time (laughs) yeah yeah but it's exciting to think that it now it's going to be oh yeah definitely and i enjoy torturing tate and jack (laughs) i get that (laughs) (laughs) As a romance author, I don't know if you've ever encountered this, but have you ever had instances of people kind of be like, oh, you write romance and looking down at you a little bit or thinking they're better than you because even if they're not published, they write a better genre than romance? Yeah, it, romance genre does definitely get, um, I'm going to use the word bad rap. It, it, I think it's gotten better over time, but it is really funny in the beginning, even just with in the beginning, just with even my family, you I would pause and be like, yeah, I write romance. And you kind of, you know, do this like side look like, and they go, oh, you do, you know, like, it's just a bizarre emotion that they, they give you on just writing a genre. That's actually like one of the biggest ones out there, you know, I mean, it's huge. And yet I always tried to figure out like why though. And I still, to this day, don't have an answer, you know, like, why is it that people react in such a funny way? And they all react differently. The one that uh, still will always get me and will always bother me <laughs> is, is that uh, a coworker of my husband's. And uh, and I go in, just pick him up from work that day. And I say hi to the coworker. And then I say, yeah, I released my first book because it was that during that time. And I was so excited. And he literally said to me, oh, and it was because we said romance and he says, oh, a romance book. Did you get your inspiration from your husband and you? And I'm like, whoa, hold up. Here. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Not That's a like- conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, why in the heck do do people feel that that's OK? And why would they even ask that? So it was the bizarrest reaction that I've ever had with romance. <laughs> yeah, I remember I kind of had this internal battle of introducing myself as initially as an indie author and then as like a romance author because of the prejudice that was prevalent because I come from more of a traditional publishing background and a literary fiction background and I decided as part of an experiment when I went to a wedding obviously pre-COVID to introduce myself as a celebrity romance author my books don't generally fit into that they are more kind of chiclet women's fiction but it's useful in terms of marketing to explain to people and I told one of my boyfriend's friends and he laughed and he abruptly shut up when I told him that I was making money from it and that I'd rank number 19 on Amazon and number one for multiple categories. And then we spent the rest of the wedding reception talking about the indie publishing community. That's so fascinating to me. Mm. And, and to know that the first reaction is a laugh, like, like, again, like, I keep trying to understand that emotion and that reaction. The irony was this came from someone who couldn't even save what he had started writing he never saved anything because he had so little confidence and at this point I'd published like four or five books and actually the other day I got an email to my blog welcome sequence someone talking about the fact that they write this particular genre which they deem to be better than romance and that wasn't the phrasing but that was basically what they said is that their genre is better than romance I'm like have you actually researched what the person you're emailing even writes yeah and why did you bother to even write that email yeah, exactly. It felt so ineducated. Totally. When, and totally. like they hadn't done any research on me or the community because actually the indie community is really, really supportive. And that's what I love about it. Doesn't it, matter what genre you write, and everyone knows how much work you put in. Yeah. Yeah. You are totally uh, spot on on that. There, there's a thing floating around on social media and I'm trying to completely ignore it, but it's very tricky because you keep seeing it pop up. But apparently someone on Twitter had, um, and you probably caught it, um, posted about how um, self-publishing is basically just shit, you know, and like, you know, it's just like these people don't even know what they're doing kind of thing. I'm just summing it up. And I thought, you know what, I'm not even going to read it to my husband. I'm not even going to give this voice because it's just so useless. But it's just fascinating how people are putting it out there and giving it voice. 
all I thought about in my head is like, gosh, like self-publishing, honestly, you can't say it's more than traditional. I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, factors and statistics you could look at, but it's in my brain, it's really powerful to be a self-published author, excuse me. Um, because not only because you are learning to do all the things yourself and you're becoming independent and creating on your own. But like you said, you have this community around you that is so dang supportive and amazing and want to share your stuff and want to help you to see you grow. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, like I, I would never change anything about my journey that I'm on and choosing self-publishing because, and I love that I get to help others in uh, being a self-published author because I find that just extremely exciting. I don't know about you, but I found particularly when I started out in 2015, 16, that the business and marketing community were actually more supportive than the literary community about my decision to go indie rather than trad. Like at the time, there were, I don't know if it's just like the circle I was in, but there seemed to be still that need for a gatekeeper to go, your book is good enough to be published rather than the reader being the person going, your book is good enough. I want to give you money for this thing. Yeah. When I when I first when I first published in uh, November 2014, that was the year that like romance self publishing was exploding. So just a few years prior to that, and some of the the authors like um, Colleen Hoover and uh, Rachel Van Dyken and all them, and I'm trying to think of a couple other ones, but my brain isn't letting me right now. Um, you know, they had started in like say 2010, 2009, and they. So they were just doing great and it was easy. And then 2014, it exploded with romance self-publishing. And so for me, what um, I was seeing is that support of self-publishing and that excitement around it. But I I can understand where like what you're saying, like, because probably because of the community that I was in, there wasn't a weirdness to it and there was still that support. But I was still figuring out that like building of the readers. So you know, um, joining, what is it like you would, you would, uh, connect with bloggers and things like that and have your, um, and do like the promotions in that way. So I didn't really have that in the beginning. So it was just kind of just connecting with people that were self-published. So, yeah, that was, I mean, that was really my experience. I mean, it was, I was in a a space though, that was almost uh, really flooded and still is flooded. Mm -hmm. So it's just trying to be unique in what you do, which, is where like I was a food blogger in the beginning uh, and then I became a writer. And so um, for my first series, I put like six, five or six recipes in each book and they were created by the characters. And so I thought, okay, well, then that's a unique way to um, distinguish me from others. But it's still, it, you know, it's, you still have to find a way to be seen. So tricky. Yeah, definitely. What marketing techniques then would you recommend to people that get their books to send out? So I, I would recommend in, it was easier back in the day to build upon an arc reader um, and finding like arc readers by doing like events and things like that. And just getting yourself out there today. I feel like it's a little bit trickier because, you know, you don't do events and you don't do takeovers as much anymore to just be seen in these, in other people's um, audiences. You know, if there is a way for you to just reach out, you know, and, and present yourself, um, like with, you know, bookstagram, um, or, um, with bloggers, um, but building a, what I call a community, but building a, a group of arc readers, even that, um, you know, that you can go to and they're, and they'll help you to promote your book and to read your book and to review your book and, um, and give you honest feedback. Cause I always make sure that, you know, I don't care that you're going to give me a three or a two, star if that happens that happens uh very rarely does my arc readers do that but it can happen and um and so i just want them to be honest and be there for me and um help me to grow and so yeah if there's a way to build upon even just a small little community of readers that you can rely on to help you to get that exposure for your book i also in 2019 started using um i had mentioned this earlier book sprout and there is a 50 50 on people's feelings of it. So you have to explore it yourself and decide for yourself. But for me in 2019, I was publishing monthly and it was short stories. I did a 16 book series of short stories 
And, um, and I started in April and I ended in December and, um, and just kind of let them roll out. And I use Booksprout and I built up, you know, readership in that way too. And being able to get um, reviews and, um, and then a community that wanted more, they joined my Facebook group and, you know, they joined me on the journey of like doing my lives and creating recipes with me and stuff. So I would say that like, if you have the ability to just start interacting, you know, and the way my coach that I have today for my online business is creating human conversations, you know, just, you know, the way you and I met, you know, it was just, well, it was, of course, for us, we know we have it, a, a similarity to our email stuff, but, you know, just creating that human conversation and, uh, and it's such a powerful tool. So if you just get into messenger, you're like, you know what, I saw you read this book and you know, you may enjoy this one. I just, I'd love to offer it to you because you don't have to give everything away for free, but you know, sometimes there's a power of, you know, just offering things like that. And, and that conversation that can build upon so much. Yeah, definitely. I know I was reluctant to make my first book free, but when I made it perma free, that's when my yeah. book sales took off. And whenever Amazon decides it doesn't want it to be free anymore, my sales go down because Amazon randomly changes the price and charges 99p for it every so often or just does in certain countries. I um, struggle with the free thing too. And I, I have the man card series, which is the, the short story one. I do have the first one for free, um, but I kind of switched everything else up. And the reason I did was just because of all the recipes that I put in the books. But yeah, you're right, 100%. Like if you have the ability to let a reader figure out who you are if they've never met you before and they don't know uh, that's a beautiful way um, or if you um, create like a bonus chapter or um, just like a little extra added story side story like I've created side stories for all my series and um, and offer them special you know and so those are little ways of you know creating something different to to build yeah or I've got a couple as well I've got I want to say two Yes, it's two. And I'm working on the third one. See, I lose count of things. <laughs> and um, they really do help. And they also add that extra piece of the world to the people who do desperately want more of it. And it fleshes out your characters and sometimes even fleshes out your side characters. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Just gives them more for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because one of my lead magnets is from the perspective of the villain of my oh, Hollywood cool. universe she's my favorite character to write about because she just doesn't give a fuck yeah she just yeah. doesn't but the reason is because of everything that has happened to her before that because everyone has just betrayed her so she doesn't want anyone in her well she does want people in her life but she pretends she doesn't because she just thinks everyone is going to hurt her and everyone who has read it has come out like 25,000 words later with a completely different view of this character they used to hate because she always causes trouble. Yeah, which is super powerful to see that aspect of it too. I love that. Yeah, and it shows kind of the really dark side of Hollywood that people don't talk about enough. It's coming up much more now, but I still don't think people realize how bad it can actually get. Yeah, yeah. It's like that well, we always talk about what, what we're working on. Like there's an Arctic, you know, that ice and, you know, you can see all the good all on the top, but you don't get to see all the shit on the bottom, you know, yeah. what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why Ellie and I do personal updates at the start as well, because sometimes it is hard. Sometimes you do struggle. Sometimes you have days where you just don't want to write. Sometimes you do consider quitting because I did a few weeks ago. And I think being upfront about that, regardless of where you are in your career is important. It's not yeah. all roses and rainbows. No, it's definitely not. I mean, heck, I said I had imposter syndrome yesterday. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was a complete dreary person for the first four hours of working and brought it into my husband's world. And he's just like, okay, honey, you know, you're fine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's, it's what we have to deal with sometimes. And so, yeah, 100%. Yeah. It's just part of it. Circling yeah. back to the marketing and the community side of things, then what would be your tips to a writer looking to build a community around their books? Because I've seen a lot of people say like, oh, I started a Facebook group and it's dead and no one posts in it and no one's engaging with it or they can't attract arc readers. So where would you suggest someone starts in terms of building that community and like building that momentum, which can be super hard to do? Yeah, it, it is definitely hard, as a, a, especially right now because of so much content. And so you're having to kind of, you know, fish your way, you know, into all of this. So I shared human conversations, right? We talked about that, like, and so 
my other favorite thing is, you know, growing with other people's audiences. So not necessarily, a lot of people talk about doing newsletter swaps. Um, personally, I feel like that floods your email too much. And you and I as email people um, understand that, you know, trying to share everybody's um, books in your own email or whatever is too much. But what I mean is, is that, you know, you, you create like some kind of maybe a partnership or connection to where you're like, you know, this week I'm launching my book. And so I would love, is it possible for you to share my book on your social platforms and with your readers? And it, you know, and you're, and you're making sure that they're just sharing that book and not all these others, because you don't want to get it drowned out. So yeah, sharing other people's audiences is a really powerful tool. So you, you potentially, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, assume that you're a new author, but, and you might have some connections already a new author like me, I didn't have any connections at all. So um, I put myself in Facebook groups that um, where I could meet people and then connect with them and then create human conversations with them. And so, yeah, finding like Facebook, Facebook groups where you can um, build upon that and, um, and see what other people are doing and seeing how you um, can build a, you know, a relationship with them. So yeah, human conversations, build, building with other people's audiences, but then um, my other favorite thing that I, it took me a long time to finally get to this point. But last year um, in August, 2020, I realized that I had to use live video to be seen. Now, some people are going to say, well, what about if my um, pen name is a secret pen name? Well, you don't have to have your face on camera. You can do live video in creative ways without being on camera. You could do other things, but uh, for me, uh, what I can share is that, you know, I started doing live video and interacting with you, you know, and communicating. And if they were on that live video with me, I would mention your name and then create, you know, an, an, a, a, just a conversation and an excitement around that book that I had. I also did like last year, um, I did a five day, um, actually it was in December, I did a five day challenge. And so that's something that you can think about like a five day like a five-day roadmap or a five-day challenge or a five-day thing that just gets a reader excited for what you're creating. And, uh, and because I did food, I created the recipes live with them uh, that were created by the characters in the books. And so talked about the books, shared the paperbacks, but then also had a recipe that I was doing. Um, so yeah, live video creating with other people's audiences and human conversations has been an extremely powerful tool for me, for sure. And by the way, full transparency, before August, 2020, I was afraid of being in front of the camera and afraid of doing the human conversations. I was a true 100% introvert. So if you're listening to this and you feel like that, I sympathize with that, but somehow, some way, because you love what you do and you love creating what you do, you have to find a way to move past that, that comfort zone, um, to share it with the world because your, your story is super special and it's special to you and somebody else is going to want to read it too. So, yeah, exactly. And I would like to add to that. I was fucking terrified of being on camera until about 18 months ago. And for a while I was having to do weekly Facebook lives and I would like to say that got me out of it, but it didn't. But it did help me realize that actually right before a Facebook Live, I would get hit by this overwhelming wave of fatigue. Mm -hmm. And it was because my body was trying to stop me from doing the live. It was my body's, yes. a, my mind, sorry, way of warning me of trying to stop me from doing this thing that I was terrified of. And when I recognized that it was an anxiety thing, I could then train myself out of it. And now I still don't enjoy lives, but... I can do them and I get good engagement and good response to them. And that's what counts. And also I really love your recipe idea. Yeah. It's, you know, honestly, guys, you, you, anybody can do it, you know, like your, all your books that you have, I'm sure that, you know, somehow a restaurant or food or something was discussed and uh, drinks, cocktails, you know, that's fun to do. Anybody could have fun just engaging in that way. Cause food is such a powerful way of bringing people together too. Oh, definitely. Like I'm, I've just got food on the brain now and it doesn't help that it's dinner time. For you. <laughs> it's almost dinner time for you and almost. Yeah. For and me. I'm not cooking. <laughs> <laughs> I cooked yesterday. So it's not my job today. You've been published then you said since 2014, 2013. Yeah. No November, 2014. Yep. How has the industry changed 
since you started publishing? It's so interesting. Yeah. Like uh, right at the moment that I published it, it was like a serious influx of everybody there. And so everybody was kind of helping everybody and they still do, by the way, I want to, I want to preface that, but, um, but it's in a different way. Um, And so you were, I feel like, whereas you were utilizing Facebook events and trying to just be seen um, today, it's almost even harder because they're even publishing even, even more in the romance world. They love rapid release. You know, I know there's an author last year. I saw that she published two books a month and for a whole year. So it's, and then there's another author. I know that she publishes one a month and she's been doing this for several years. So, you know, rapid release is such a big deal and, um, and it's almost hard to keep up with that. So I would say that the, the, the shift that I saw was, is it wasn't rapid release necessarily. And it shifted to, in the probably three or four years later. And, um, and then I felt like I had to do that. So you always feel like you have to kind of do what everybody else is doing. It's still rapid release, but what's changed personally for me is that I had to realize that that isn't who I am and that isn't what I can do. So while marketing is, you know, yeah, that you have to decide what you are and where you want to be in that space of, the craziness of, of trying to be seen and, um, and all the books that are coming out. How are you going to approach that? Yeah, I've spoken to some author coaches and some authors and they've said like rapid release is not sustainable and it can just all. leave you really burnt out. Totally, 100%. Yeah, I mean, and like I said, in 2019, I did it and I almost gave up by September. And I'm like, no, I've committed to this. I'm finishing this out. It was the worst experience for me. And that's a personal thing, but it was so intense because you are locked and loaded on having to do this and everybody's excited about it. And they're wanting more and more and more. Um, And I feel like you, you know, just like anything in our lives, right? You train, you train your readers to expect that. And now like I had where the readers knew they'd get maybe three a year to going to 16 short stories in a year. And then like dumped back to, I think the next year, 12, 2020 was the pandemic. So I released three. So I went back to three and, uh, and now this year building the online business, I'm going to probably release one because I have a commitment and that's it. So, um, I feel like, yeah, you got to really pay attention to how you're, um, how you're going to do that. If you really are going to be committed on doing that, you, you've got to make sure that your readers understand that is it forever or is it not, but also 100%, I agree. That's not sustainable because I feel like as, um, as a writer, we need to think about what's the long term. What, what do we see ourselves in 10, 20 years? What do we want to be doing? Uh, and for me, I want to be creating and helping, you know, and doing all the things I don't want to feel burnt out. Like you just said. Yeah. It's not a fun feeling to be burnt out. Is it? No, not at all. It's horrible. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What was your reader response then when you moved to rapid release and then away from it? How did they react? You know, it's funny. Some of them were really excited, but I wouldn't say, I would say like a third of them stayed right with me. But the other two thirds, like that was too much for them because I had already had, you know, con- I'm going to use the word condition, but that's a horrible word. But because that's not what I mean by that. Um, but the, those the readers that I've always had were just used to, like I said, three books a year. And then here I am dumping all these books. And some of them were like, I can't keep up, but I'll get to them sometime. Oh, I have that because they have busy lives. So, um, yeah, it probably for my community, it probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. It was a test, but it wasn't the smartest test to do because yeah, my readers just weren't into that. Did you find it taught you anything about yourself or your writing skills doing it? Yeah, I got better. Like I found an edit. I happened to find my editor at that point. I had an editor, um, but she couldn't do the book that I had coming out um, in April. And so someone recommended this, um, recommended Chrissy to me. And I believe still today that she made me um, a better writer in that year because she helped me to paint the pictures even more because we were working with each other so much uh, monthly, every couple of weeks kind of thing. (laughs) So um, yeah, I definitely believe that I did get better as a writer. And I mean, I still loved everything I was doing. It was just too much, but yeah. Yeah, that's totally understandable. And also like 
finding the right editor and getting the right feedback it can't be overstated the importance of it and the difference it makes yeah i mean i i always stress that all the editors that i have um have had um even up to chrissy have been wonderful and um and i'm thankful for every single one of them but when i share with with my clients it's i always stress that you know if you um if you really want your book to be what you envision it, that connection that you can create with your editor um, is such a powerful tool. And so, yeah, I mean, like I know we're able to have like when we're finding an editor for the first time and you can do like a test thing and have them read it. Um, But sometimes that's even tricky too, because, you know, they're just looking at it and you're not getting that full scope of who they are really truly. Um, So sometimes it can, you know, like you just let them do that book and then you're like, I'm not feeling it. So find another one. Don't be afraid to just keep, you know, searching for the one that's going to bring you um, that connection that you're looking for to help you to make your book better. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to kiss a few frogs to find the right editor. Perfectly said. Yes. 100%. (laughs) That's how I always look at it. And one of the things I love about mine is that she comments on the positives as well. So like when I've got a particularly emotional scene, she'll like comment at the end of it, like you're breaking my heart, but I love it. Stuff like that. That's really encouraging and remind you that you have got some of this right. And to keep that bit and not try and break it to fix something else that doesn't quite work later or earlier. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely need to hear all of the positives and negatives. 100%. Let's talk a little bit about you then. How do you help writers with their writing and publishing? So I basically knew that I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning. So there's got to be people out there that don't know what they're doing either. And so um, what I do, and because I had a barrier, um, being told that you're not a good writer is is a huge barrier to take you know, take on. Uh, So I know that there's a lot of barriers that we have to creating our stories. And yet the amount of people that I meet that talk about how they wanted to write a book is wild. So I help aspiring writers to basically just move past those barriers that are holding them back so that they'll share their stories. But what I do is we, you know, start at the very, very beginning. And we just look at like, what is it you're thinking about? And and why are you thinking about it? And why are you going to create this story? Because if we don't know our why, why are we doing it? We have to have that. And then that helps you to start doing the planning, plotting. So I, I take them through all the stages that we all take, go through as, as an author, a published author, planning, plotting. And uh, my new thing I'm going to be offering uh, that launches this month is that when you get to the writing stage, okay, well now I'm writing, but you've got this busy life and you've got these barriers that you're still working on. You're still building those habits around creating. And so I'm creating a membership to, so that um, you can do live writing sessions with them and be accountable with them. Because here's the thing, I'm my target audience. I struggle too with time. I struggle too with all the little things that hold me back from writing my stories. And so having somebody to write with um, over the years has been super powerful. I had um, several writing partners and they've all been amazing. And so, um, and then taking them on to publishing, which that's the big one that I noticed that um, I have an a la carte service where I meet you where you're at. Like if you've already written and edited your book, and you're like, but I have no idea where to publish or how or what. Um, and that's the big one. And um, and so just talking about all your possibilities with that, because there's so much, there's more than just one, you know, there's multiple avenues that you can take. Um, and then helping with promoting. I never guarantee, and I make this, I make this a huge stress, uh, like a big thing. Uh, maybe I should put it in like neon sign that I don't stress that I'm going to help you become a bestseller. That's not my job. My job is to help you to get your story out there. And I'm going to help you to do all the things so that maybe that can happen. And I always let people know, I tried to do the bestseller thing twice and my books got close to there, but they didn't get there. And I did all the ads and I did all the things that the best-selling authors told me to do. So I don't guarantee anything. I just help them to do what they've been thinking about for a long time and help them through the process and all the stages uh, so that they can share it with the world finally. Have you noticed any patterns of things that hold people back from sharing their story? Yeah, that fear of just sharing it. Like, you know, like what are people going to think? Or the big one is, is do I even have a story to tell? Like people tell me I have this story, but is it even a story? Is it even worth sharing with somebody? And, uh, and then the moment you hear it, by the way, and then you're like, holy cats, like you need to share this story. It's going to be gorgeous. So um, that hesitation of, is it even worth it? Is it even something? Yeah, that 
sounds very familiar, I think, because one of the things I emphasize in productivity for writers is you need to know why you aren't as productive as you want to be in the first place before yeah. you can drink more water or exercise more or do all the meditations yeah. and things. Because none of those things mean diddly squat if you don't know why you're depressed or why you're not very confident in your writing ability or whatever that barrier is holding you back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and I should share that, you know, like being told you, being told what I was told and then holding back for nine years, you know, I, you know, yeah, you do have those struggles of, of is my writing good enough? And one thing I can say is, and any writer will tell you this, I'm, I'm going to guess that you're going to say this too. Your first books are never going to be super beautiful. They're, they're not going to be like, ah, oh, they're going to be that first time writer. But that doesn't mean that you're a bad writer. It means that you've created a story and that's amazing. And there's still a community around that. You know, so when I say that my first book, I personally always like, yeah, that's my weakest book. And my husband would be like, why would you tell people that? And then like people read it. And still today people go, oh my God, I love Isabel and Drew so much. That's like my favorite. And they're still the reason that I love what I do and on this journey, you know? So don't let, you know, those, those little barriers hold you back from even starting the process, like at all, just go for it. Oh yeah. I, uh, struggled to look back on my first book for a long time and then I had to because of the overlap that I mentioned before and actually yeah. going back through it has taught me quite a bit and made me realize how I've changed as a writer and I do have moments yeah. where I go oh that's actually quite good and yeah. it, it's always built my confidence it's such a powerful tool yeah I love that and I'm not usually the kind of person to go back through my love writing like I 100% wouldn't have done if it wasn't for the overlap that just has to happen there's no other way to do the book so it was definitely reassuring to go back through some bits and see how I'd done things and like yeah. some of the description and be like oh that's a really nice description I'm, I should do that something in that I style that. in the future yeah <laughs> yeah I love that yeah but at the same time you know this is a marathon it's not a sprint so you are gonna grow yes. as time goes on and sometimes you'll be faster and sometimes you'll be slower and that's just the nature of it Totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, just because I wrote, you know, one of my books in 21 days, because I said in January, I'm going to write this book this month. Boom. And I logged it and I did it in 21 days. There is literally no reason why I did that other than <laughs> it was just this internal thing. So don't ever feel like you have to quickly do anything. Just, you know, and I know like NaNoWriMo, we, I was just talking about this the other day and that NaNoWriMo has that, you know, write your 50,000 words in a month in, in November. And it's that emotion of, you know, oh my gosh, so I've got to finish a book then. Right. And, but no, like you're just writing, you're just writing each day. And there it's a, it's a community within NaNoWriMo that's saying, just write. It, I feel like it's just creating that habit and helping you to get back on track. So don't ever feel like you have to finish it quickly or anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I can write a book fairly quickly, but I found the pressure of Nano Remo just too much. Yeah. And I I did finish the book, but I hated it and nearly quit writing fiction altogether because I hated it so much. And I think you just have to find a system that works for you. Like for me, the accountability of my friends works. The pressure for myself works, but it felt like external pressure on an idea where I actually hadn't fleshed out as much as I thought. And my first drafts are not 50,000 words. They're usually 20 to 30. And that's just the way that I write. That's a powerful statement right there too, because you you know how like how you're around people that will talk about how, you know, oh, I wrote this big, huge book and it's a hundred thousand or it's, oh, it's, it, it's 75,000 or, you know, whatever. And whenever I would talk about like my first book, I think was 47,000 words. And, uh, and then I went to 54,000 words and my romantic suspenses are at max 64,000 words. And people would tell me that my, I wrote short books. They kept calling me. They kept going, oh yeah, Tara, you write short books. And I'm like, that's not a short book. Like, what are you talking about? So I love that you just shared that, you know, because whatever you write is perfect. It doesn't matter. It's not about worrying about your word count that everybody else is doing around you. Just write your yeah. story. For me, my first drafts, like I say, usually 20 to 30. The longest one I can think of was about 37. And my books usually double in length when I edit it because that's when I add in a lot of the description and the world building and things like that. And sometimes I add in like scenes that sew everything together because I'm just, I get the plot out and I get the dialogue out and worry about making it all sexy and make sense for other people later because I find the hardest part is getting that idea out of my head. 
Yeah, no, that's true. That makes a lot of sense too, 100%. But you have to try these different techniques and see what works for you. Yeah, I mean, um, my biggest message these days is uh, my, my course is called Your Story, Your Way for a reason. It's, it's, I'm not telling you how to write your book. I'm there to help you um, and do whatever you like. I've been thinking about doing this. Okay, well, let's talk about it and let's help you do that process um, because it's not my story. It's your story. And, uh, and I have been doing what everybody else has been doing for so long because it's like, oh, Tara, I did this for ads or I did this for, you know, launching. And so then I would do that, but, and it worked for them, but it didn't work for me. And so then you think like, oh, my book's shit because it's not working. And that's not it at all. It's just that that process worked for their community. And so create a space that is for you and your audience and your books and that works perfectly for you. And that's that's all you can do. You can't worry about what everybody else is doing. And that takes trial and error. And I think that can frustrate people who are as impatient as we are. But it's a case of what's stronger, your impatience or your desire to create and publish. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, it, you got to decide out what's important to you. Speaking of things that are important to you, what is one book that changed your life? Other than the Susan Mallory one you spoke about at the start. Yeah, no, my, my number one book that changed my life literally 100% uh, was The Red Tent by uh, Anita Diamant. And I know I'm Diamante, I think it is, but The Red Tent. So I got done with that internship and dealt with that director who said the words that she said and um, came home and had, and there was, there's a whole laundry list of things that happened during that time too, but, and thought, you know, like, I don't, know what is going to happen next. I don't know what to do. Um, and I don't know where to go with my life. And I read the book and finished the book and went, huh. And looked at Dinah's path throughout that whole story and realized that, you know, if we just live here in this moment and just soak up all the negative, it's not going to help us to move forward. Right. So my husband and I created uh, a saying of just, just go only forward, just move only forward. I even have it tattooed on my arm and, you know, and just let go of what happened back then. And, uh, and cause that's what Dinah did too. So, and it, yeah, it 100% changed me. That's really beautiful. I love that. I love that you've got it tattooed on your arm as well. Yeah. It's hard to show you, but it's in Sanskrit, which, ah. uh, and then I have dream big here and yeah, so I did. I had somebody that is a major yogi and I said, I need this in Sanskrit because I love yoga and meditation. Amazing. That reminds me. Do you find it helps to see those things every day? Yeah, I need reminders for sure. I need my husband around that reminds me. Uh, he's my he's my catalyst for everything that I do in my life. You know, I always call him my angel and I always thank him in my books because he is the reason I am where I am today but also just those reminders that we tell each other, um, you know, like yesterday I had to go to him after imposter syndrome and I was like, I need my Brian, you know, I need him. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. Having those reminders keeps us going and keeps us stronger. Definitely. Where can our listeners go to find out more about you then? Uh, well, all my social platforms are Tara Kelly author. So if you do at Tara Kelly author, wherever you're at, you're going to find me. Um, and then my website is Tara Kelly.com. On terrakelly.com, I have my business on the right side and my books on the left side. So you'll be able to see both things that I do. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a really great chat. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Did you find this episode enlightening? Don't forget to hit that shiny, shiny subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. Or if you're watching on YouTube, give us a subscribe and hit the like button. It really helps other writers find our videos and lets us know what type of content you want more of. And don't forget, you can support the writer's mindset over on Patreon for less than your favorite coffee a month. Join our growing gang of writers to get early access to episodes, bonus content, weekly writing sprints and monthly catch ups with us. Visit patreon.com forward slash writers mindset to come join us. And don't forget to check out our free Facebook group, which you can find at writerscookbook.com forward slash Facebook group. We're in there every day talking all things writing, mindset, reading, and occasionally pets. So it'd be great to see you in there. See you next time. Keep writing. <laughs>